You are live now. Tonight, I'm standing in for Tiffany Sunshine Brown because every great humanitarian needs a night off. We miss you, Tiffany, and we'll see you soon. Tonight, I'm fortunate to have my friend Carla Carlisle on the show, who I have been a huge fan of for many years because we've both worked through foster care and adoption. And she has just risen to a superhero level oh, with her, wow. her dedication to becoming a parent through this very complicated bureaucracy of adoption. Um, so I'm so honored to introduce Carla Car Carlisle. And I hope that she will tell us a little bit about the story of how she came to adopt her son. Literally, my jaw was at the bottom of the floor when I heard it. Um, and tell us about why it um, inspired her to write The Journey to the Sun. Journey, did I say that right? Journey to the Sun? Yes, Journey to the Sun. Okay, yeah. Journey to the Sun. That's all right. <laughs> And um, a few other things that she's got in the works. Um, I want us to tell, I want her to tell, uh, tell us how we can get these books and read and become more active. So Carla, without further ado, please take it away. Thank you so much, Tara and feel better, Tiffany. I hope you're getting some rest. So well, thank you for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here. So I guess I would start off with uh, a little bit about my journey to motherhood. Um, I started off, um, I married late after, um, you know, I was living in the Washington DC area. I married kind of later in life. I was focused on career and that kind of thing. And my husband and I had some major fertility issues. Uh, we went through in vitro fertilization and I miscarried through that process. And as I've said many times, like infertility can bring a couple closer together or it can help tear them apart. And in our case, uh, it was a contributor to the end of our marriage. And so after my divorce, what I um, did was just kind of take a step back to take stock of you know, what was really important to me. And ultimately it was about being a mother. It wasn't about giving birth. It wasn't about that experience, although I would love to have had it. It was ultimately about being a mom. So a good friend of mine suggested that I go through the foster care process, which I did. And I went through that long arduous process to become a foster parent through Mecklenburg County here in uh, North Carolina. And I got a couple of calls and I wasn't quite ready to become a foster parent. And then I received a call from my social worker that there was a preemie who was in need of a foster home. And I had no intentions of fostering a, a baby, a newborn, let alone a preemie. But my niece and nephew were both preemie. So of course that tugged at my heart and said, how long do I have to decide? And she said, now. And so I went to the hospital and I picked up this beautiful baby boy who was 10 days old and he just stole my heart. So for the next six months, um, I was his foster mom. You know, my company let me take off work and I just settled into parenting him and everything that came along with it. He was immediately accepted in as a part of our family and it was wonderful. And then about six months into the arrangement, um, the court decided to give him to his birth mother. And I was, I knew going into foster parenting that that, that reunification was the ultimate goal. And my intention as a foster parent was to follow those guidelines. Uh, there's also, just like with anything else we see, you know, if you know something's not right, it's like, what do you do about it? So what I chose to do after probably a week or two was to reach out to the birth mom directly. 
I let my foster license go. And for the next six years, uh, we had this very tumultuous relationship where I tried to co-parent with her and the father. And I'm saying this in a very matter of fact way, but this was a deeply emotional, difficult situation. It was one that I would say I didn't have a lot of support for because everybody was like, go on to the next child. And I'm like, no, I'm sure this child is in danger. And because I was sure he was in danger, I felt compelled and I loved him. So I felt very compelled to stay connected. And that arrangement worked to the extent it could for six years. When my son was five, um, he started talking about dying by suicide. And if you can imagine as a parent, foster parent, aunt, uncle, cousin, whatever you are, hearing a five-year-old talk that way, how devastating it is and how helpless one might feel. Well, in my case, I had no legal rights. So there wasn't a lot that I could do other than what I had been doing, which was trying to continue to work through the system, work with um, child advocacy groups and, and DSS to say, you know, hey, is there support that can be given here? Like, what can we do? And I really got nowhere. Basically what I was told was you have no birth connection to him. So you need to just move on. You know, I consulted with therapists and all kinds of things and just learned that um, there was really no path for me. It wasn't until my son was six and tried to die by suicide twice that I ended up hiring a private attorney and that attorney within three days uh, helped me get emergency custody of my child. And that was at the end of 2016. And then about two years later in 2018, then um, I adopted him. But I, one of the things that I wanted to share was through this process, I, mean, I, I think it's important to really communicate the impact that it has on you, or in this case, me as an individual, any mother or foster parent or, you know, birth mother, whatever the role is, father, um, to see your child in trouble, to see your child and you're helpless to affect change is devastating. And so through experience and understanding that his mother and father were victims of generational trauma. So trauma that was passed on from one generation to the next, things that include you know, domestic violence and drug abuse. And those are all more or less like coping skills, really bad coping skills for pain and trauma. So as I saw the same thing was starting to happen to my child and he was child number 11, I had to act and I did. And I will tell you, it was really painful for me to take action against his birth parents because I really wanted to help them. Um, but what I learned was I wasn't qualified to do so. And I think I was probably enabling them to stay um, in that space of leaning on things that really aren't the healthiest coping mechanisms. I really feel like they didn't have much of a chance because they didn't see differently growing up. They lacked that foundation. And that's what I tried to give them, but I wasn't equipped to do that. What I was equipped to do was to focus on my child. And that's what I did. So you actually went through great extremes to try and rehabilitate this family itself. I remember things I did. like helping provide housing for this yes. family. Can yeah. you elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. So a lot of it I will share very candidly. I kept from my loved ones and I was estranged from many of my loved ones or I would say I put this stuff in a box because I wasn't comfortable sharing it and I knew people would try to talk me out of it. I, at first I was helping with paying rent and for essentials, 
you know, helping them get a car and things like that. And then it got to the point that um, like one of the places they lived in, and this was me just like not knowing what I was dealing with. Like I didn't know about living life in survival mode because I, I grew up in this, not a wealthy family, but a family that had just enough and, and was, had this foundation of love. So I didn't understand, like when you live your life in survival mode, that's what your focus is. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to have the same uh, reaction to it. But, you know, when you have to protect yourself from those who are supposed to take care of you, people, children who grow into adults handle it differently. And so in this situation, what I found was that I could not literally, there were times I could not sleep at night thinking about my baby at a motel where a murder had taken place a few days before or something like that. Or the last place, there were so many mice in it, like a snake showed up and I had to find out from someone else I knew, like if a snake shows up at the house, there are a lot of mice in the house. So how is my two-year-old, like what's gonna happen to him? And you know, this isn't even about poverty, as much as it is when, when a person lives their life in survival mode without some exposure, outside support, there are the, some essential fundamental things that people don't learn to do. And there are other people who do find out how to do it and, and end up highly uh, living wonderful lives and, and very happy lives. So I don't mean to generalize this, this trauma in this particular family struck and cut deep with no, from what I saw, no external support. And so I bought a house. It was, it was just a basic, decent house. It was clean. I put groceries in the house. I did all these things. Be, and I tried like, let's try therapy. Let's try these different things. <clears throat> but what I was doing really was perpetuating the situation. Like I was making it probably worse because I was making it comfortable to stay in that same state. So I have a lot of lessons learned from this process. And I also walked into the foster care system knowing that at the time in Mecklenburg County, you could not foster to adopt. But my social worker knew that I wanted to adopt. And so, you know, in this situation, because the other children have been removed from the home permanently and rights terminated, you know, all signs pointed to, you know, it was likely that, you know, I might be able to actually uh, get the child. Once I met the parents and he did go back, I was determined to make it work with them. And it wasn't until we got into crisis mode that I felt I had to make a change, an immediate and urgent change. Did that answer your question? That was beautiful. <laughs> um, okay. I can't, I can't, like I've reared 29 kids in the foster care system. So I understand where you're coming from and I can't imagine as kind as we are buying a house to stabilize this child. Um, and you really did try everything. Um, but here's what I'm going to say. Even though people were telling you, cut your ties, you're not the mom. Something actually did happen where you were rewarded for staying in the life of this child for six years. Can you talk about that for a minute? Well, if you're speaking of me getting custody... Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> so it was a uh, it was a very traumatic time to get to that point. So um, I would say like the year before, well, a couple of months before he threatened to die by suicide, he said it verbally. Um, I had a situation with his uh, mom. We were the three of us were driving in a car. And I was driving, his birth mom was in the front seat and he was in the back seat and he was about five years old. And um, she has some pretty significant mental health conditions, which I was aware of. Um, but I spent a lot of time with her, much more time with her than really anyone else for six years. Um, and this particular 
day, I don't even remember what the disagreement was about, but she got really mad and hit me in the face hard when I was driving with him in the car. And that at that moment, I knew that everything I was doing was, was wrong. I just pulled over, I got out of the car, I hit my knees and I just was like, God, you know, I give up, like I need help. And that was kind of the beginning of the end of our relationship. And, you know, the first thing people say as soon as they hear that is, didn't you want to hit her back? And this and that. I didn't want to do any of those things. The first thing that came to my mind is if she's willing to hit me and I'm taking care, I'm providing for the household, including her and the father, what's happening to my child when I'm not there? So all those sleepless nights were kind of in my mind it was like the realization of all those sleepless nights. And so once he tried to die by suicide at age six, um, I did get emergency custody through my attorney. I went through a private attorney and I was able to prove there's something called, I had never heard of it before, in locos parentis, in place of the parent, of the birth parent. And I had not intentionally, but just through life. I had put him in a private school. You know, I had, he has had a bedroom in my house. I was able to prove that I had been acting as his parent for all of his life. And because he was not safe with his parents because of, of um, a lot of violence and drugs and things that were going on, again, all bad coping mechanisms for trauma. Um, I was awarded custody in three days. And from there, um, you know, I went through the court system for two years and eventually uh, the adoption was finalized. We had to go through termination of parental rights and the whole thing. It was very tough, but my focus was my son and about him being safe. And I had to come to the realization that for him to be safe, I had to be safe. For, him, for me to take care of him, I had to take care of myself. And one of the things I wanted to share that I did not really go into a significant detail about in my book, I did a little bit, but since then I've had a lot of time to reflect and that's why I'm working on a second edition. Um, it's because I didn't talk a whole lot about what this journey did to me. Uh, Ultimately, it made me a much better person. Even people at work are like, you're a different Carla. You're a different person. You are very caring and loving. I remember one guy who worked for me, I felt horrible when I first got my son as a foster child. He said, now I see the human side of Carla because I was like a machine, you know? I was divorced, I was just focused in, let's get it done, let's get it done, let's get it done. But we're all humans and we're all going through things and that's the good side of things. The tough side is that I ended up uh, depressed and with major anxiety. And I still have bouts with anxiety on a regular basis, but I do therapy and I have writing, which helps me. I have an awesome um, coach who helps me with uh, writing when I get stuck, Glenn Proctor. And uh, he's just been amazing and a, a multitude of people who have helped me along the way. So I went from basically having no, vi no village to when I opened up, then the village grew and it, and it included the people I love the most. So. That's amazing. It truly does take a village to yes. raise a family. Um, yes. and once you got your book completed, you created a whole nother network of people that love you and admire your work. So there is another layer on that as well. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'd like you to reflect on, one of the challenges that I had as a foster mother was actually um, finding appropriate health care for these individuals. Um, and that's mm -hmm. why I, as an individual, support Medicare for all. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about um, your experience with um, the, the medical side of this? And has your son been able to get adequate care? Um, has this been a major financial burden on your family? 
So my son was on Medicaid uh, in the foster care system. And then when he went back to his birth mom, he, he had Medicaid and he actually has Medicaid with me as well as private insurance. He qualified for Medicaid uh, because of his history uh, and, you know, diagnoses like PTSD, ADHD, DMDD, depression and anxiety, uh, and that he had been in the system. What I found was that I had to get very educated and where I lacked, I needed to lean on the people with the knowledge who were willing to help and support me. So organizations like Mental Health America, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, they all helped me. Even my IEP program at school, I mean, at school, <laughs> at work, at work, they were so helpful with me understanding my rights as a parent and, and getting what he needed. And so, for example, here's a, a perfect example of he has Medicaid, but Medicaid at some point said he doesn't need occupational therapy anymore. He's been going long enough because they look at it in like, he's been, he has it gone a year, has he gone two years? But within those two years, he only went like once every three months, something like that. And so they denied continued occupational therapy. Through my private insurance, I'm able to continue that. But instead of doing that, I actually put him in this program called Brain Balance to help him catch up with his developmental delays. And I'm, I'm really excited about trying to work with organizations like Brain Balance to provide services like that or scholarships to children whose parents can't afford it or don't even know about it. Um, because I have seen my son, I think when he first tested developmentally, not in intelligent, not his intellect, but developmentally, he was delayed. So an example of that was um, he could do math like a, a whiz, but he couldn't tie his shoes when he was eight. So back, going back to your question, I feel like Medicaid for all is very critical. And I, I am on the, um, public policy and advocacy committee with Mental Health America. And I am a big proponent of Medicaid, Medicare, I'm sorry, for all, because I see even when people have some of the benefits, they don't understand what they are, or they just don't have the benefits at all. And they go without. And, and either one of those scenarios are unacceptable. So um, it, it's something I feel very strongly about. And, and I will tell you, when, when my, I first got custody of my son, I literally created a spreadsheet. I had 35 to 40 either service providers, individuals, you know, testers, you know, you name it, I had it. And what they provided and if it, they were active or not. But I don't expect every person to do that or even to be, to be able to do it or to think to do it. That's just kind of the project management, program management background I have. And just, again, leaning on other people. But I worked with Cardinal Innovations to get a, uh, uh, like a caseworker care consultant, I think they were called. Um, he ended up going to Alexander Youth Network. I'm on the board of Alexander, with the Alexander Children's Foundation now. Anything that I can do like to affect change and to get the word out about children in need. I, I even, I'll tell you this and then I'll stop talking. I, I ran into a little boy who was at Alexander with my son and he was on my son's football team. And this little boy, he was so, he presented as so angry. You know, everybody's like, oh, he has an anger management problem. He has an anger problem. He had experienced such trauma I knew, I could see it. I literally one day came up and they're like, hey, maybe you can talk to him. And I, I just said, hey, I, I'm gonna take a walk. I mean, I didn't go far, I was right there. Like, do you wanna walk with me? And he ended up taking my hand and we walked together and it was like, he needed that touch, a good touch. He needed to know that somebody cared and could he could just connect with, it's like, what I've learned through this whole process is that whether it's through the big brothers, big sisters, you know, someplace like Alexander, any type of organization like 
a loving advocate is so critical for a child that ex has experienced significant trauma. And since I now know that suicide is the second leading cause of death for young adults ages five to 24, and I know my son could have been one of those statistics, like I leverage every avenue I can that is appropriate and a good fit for us to grow our village. So I answered probably much more than you wanted, but that's the truth. That is so inspirational. Every parent should look up to you. Um, the fact of the matter, you, you radiate love for this child and it biologically, he's not your child, but yet you have moved mountains to be his, his mother. You're more of a mother to him than he will ever realize. Um, I truly he better believe realize it one of these days. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He, he, um, you know, I guess I shouldn't say that. I always said, um, um, you know, you are his real mother, but biological. I always want to make a distinction because I'm an adoptive mother. I am my son's real mother, but I'm not his biological mother. Right. Um, there's so no blood between us, mother. but there's something deeper than blood. I mean, love go, runs deeper than blood. And at the end of the day, if I had not had him in my life, I really think that I would have led a much lonelier, less and less empathetic life. I've learned so much about trauma and specifically about generational trauma and the impact. Like I feel compelled to educate and share and also let parents know like you're not alone. I work with, um, well, we're not doing it right now because of COVID, but I work with local law enforcement and NAMI Charlotte got me involved in uh, talking with law enforcement through the crisis intervention team training, just sharing our story, you know, making like putting a human face with a mental health crisis because I did have to call for a CIT officer when my son was younger. He was very, like you think of fight, flight, or freeze. He was a fighter and he was a big kid. He was almost 170 pounds. He's much, he weighs a lot less now and he's much older, but he was, you know, morbid, considered morbidly obese and he was strong. And I had to learn how to parent him. I went up to Rowan County. I took, I got trauma informed training. Uh, as a resource parent, because I, I didn't qualify here in Mecklenburg County, which is interesting. But you know, any, any door that shut in my face, I found another one. And I think that's uh, perseverance is something that's so critical, but everyone doesn't have the same skill set, And that's why I try to stand in the gap a lot of times or to connect people. Like I believe in the power of connection. I work with a lot of, um, people who are therapists and, you know, people with lived experience. And I, I see what each person brings to the table. I have a lot of master's degrees on my wall. Well, two of them and an undergraduate degree. And once I met that child, I could, I could just throw them in the trash because I was, it did not prepare me for this experience. At the same time, like the IEP therapist was able to help me validate some of what seemed right or wrong or logical or Ill illogical through that whole process. Or my therapist helped me with coping mechanisms for me because there was so much that I didn't have control over. It actually, this whole experience taught me like, Carla, you've got to stop living your life based on fear. I was scared of losing him. I was scared of so many things. Like I didn't realize through that whole time with his birth parents, they really were leaning on me more than I was leaning on them. But I was so fearful for what might happen. And once I let go of that fear and I was ready to even let him go, if he, had, if he ended up going in the system, I was willing to do that because I knew and I validated because his mom used to tell me this all the time, if he went back into the system, she could say, I do not want Carla to get custody and they would have to honor her wishes. So just like the story in the Bible where the two women claimed the baby, one of them had to be willing to let the baby go. And that's the one that ended up getting the baby. I wasn't thinking that in the, you know, 
in that moment, I was thinking this child is going to die. If we don't, if I don't do something about it, if I'm not willing to let him go, he's going to die. And that I couldn't live with. You're on mute, I think. That is so strong of you to be able to, um, to do all this and hold it together and um, be the superhero, even though you didn't feel like it, you were. You were the superhero that saved your son. So he eventually came to you and became your, your legal guardian. Um, what does your family look like now? So, so now, <laughs> over the last three or four years, We've added two uh, young men to our family and they are actually getting ready to go to college on Friday. I am so excited. I'm taking them away to an HBCU on Friday. I'm so thrilled for them. Um, it, is, it is just amazing to see, like one of them came to me kind of through circumstances. The other one came to me um, uh, through a family friend who was leaving town and he wanted to finish high school here. Uh, but both of them, you know, early childhood, they, they had a, some trauma that they experienced. And I'm just so proud of both of them. And I love them so much. So I have my three boys mm -hmm. and three dogs and only one of my dogs is a female. And so I'm kind of outnumbered here, but uh, it's going to be interesting when the big boys, you know, go away to school because, you know, it'll be me and my guy and the three dogs and, um, you know, our new normal will be different, just like everybody's had to adjust with the pandemic. Um, but I will also say this, like, thank God for my family, because once I did open up to them, I kind of opened up to them about a lot of things after the fact. But the one thing I can say above anything else is that they love my boys as if I gave birth to them. They love my sons. We, we recently lost our mom and my, my son, who the, is the you know, focus of my book, um, is, uh, was a light of her life. You know, just she, she loved him with her all. And I feel like he, he breathes new life into like my dad who's still living. He, we just moved him here to North Carolina. And, and it's just been amazing. Like family comes to you in ways other than how you may think, but I couldn't ask for a better family or a better village at this point. You know, of course there are tough times. And Tara, I wanted to pause for a second because I did get a, um, a note on Facebook Live asking if brain, if brain balance has been effective and if it would work on adults. Do you mind if I answer? Oh, please do. Okay. So the question was, has brain balance really been effective? And the answer to that is absolutely. Um, if you're interested, you can reach out to me and I can try to work with brain balance to get you either a free or reduced cost assessment. I'm, I'm not a paid spokesperson for them. I'm just telling you our own experience. I actually found out about them through a holistic doctor that I saw because I knew my son had um, been exposed to a lot of toxins. So uh, I think her name is Tiff Dr. Tiffany Brown Bush. And Tiffany w uh, talks a lot about brain balance. She focuses a, a lot on, on the natural things, which you can't necessarily get supported through Medicaid or Medicare, but, uh, and brain balance was, I actually went to this video she showed, Tiffany, Dr. Tiffany showed, uh, where Gina from Martin, her son has, is autistic and she took him to brain balance and it made all the difference in the world. Now, I'm not saying everybody will have the same results, but what I'll say is my son from a developmental perspective grew I would say in age, from a develop, develop, developmental standpoint, about a year and a half. So he went from age about five to six in development to age seven in, in 36 visits, which, you know, it was intensive. And we're, we are going back, we're taking a little break right now because with the pandemic and everything else, we just, I just need to slow it down. He has a tutor. 
but I see the development in him. And, you know, if, if people are familiar with developmental delays, it's like that right side of his brain just hasn't caught up with the left side. And so he processes things differently. He's very smart, but, uh, you know, he may just get stuck on one thing and erase 200 times, you know, it's like you can move on. He's, he's not on the autism spectrum, but they do see children on the spectrum. And so anyway, it's been really effective for us. And I know a few more people who have done it. It's, it is very expensive. Um, and it says, would it work for, with adults too? I don't know the age they go up to. I think it's something like 19 or 20, but I think it's worth looking into. And, and if they don't provide services for adults, I think that it would be worthwhile to you know, even check with them to see if they know someone who does. So hopefully I answered that question. Absolutely. Um, I have two more questions for you, at least. Okay. I, I can't see the list of questions. So anytime we get a questions from the audience, I definitely want um, to, to answer okay. those. So just interrupt me. Um, I okay. wanted to, to know how your family has changed during COVID. Oh, that's a great question. So with three boys, two teens and one 10 year old, uh, and then we got a puppy during COVID. So we, the three dogs, uh, it's been pretty difficult. Um, but one of the things that we've done is, um, is find fun things to do together. Or like um, I had the boys start working out with a trainer outside like once or twice a week. And they were able to stay active. They do a lot of basketball around the house and stuff. But sometimes it's just about getting out and taking a drive, you know, giving them their personal time. And also as extroverted as I am and have been, I have learned the importance of having just time to myself. <laughs> so I make sure that I have time to myself. I make sure that I have adult time, whether it's Zoom with family and friends or, you know, talking on the phone to one of my best friends or, you know, having a virtual date, you know, okay. every now and then, you know, <laughs> it's possible, you know, just having a little bit of a social life and then just taking time for me. Um, those things have been really important. And so my two older sons, they did a summer program uh, with their uh, university and it was virtual. So it kept them pretty busy. I got a little pool, not a major pool, but a little pool and they, we were able to do that. And so we have, you know, a very small circle of people we engage with. So we did everything we could um, to stay active and busy. And then with, especially with the older boys and then in a different way with my youngest son, I've been able to be very transparent with them about the whole pandemic, about things that are going on, even in terms of the racial in, racial injustices, you know, what I, pray for for them and what I expect of them and and vice versa we have family meetings we do things I mean it may sound corny to people but it actually is pretty awesome like just the other day we had Sunday dinner and I said before you leave the table I want to hear something positive about each person each person go around the table and then the last person you say something good about is yourself and we all did that and it just ended the the meal on on just the positive note, you know, because they everybody's getting on each other's nerves. We're all in the house. We have room, but it just happens. And then, you know, going to school is different. But again, the the village is working and helping. So I mean I think our family is affected the same way. The only other thing I will mention is that, you know, the importance of telehealth because we have been doing therapy uh, via Zoom. Oh, and man. so I'm a big proponent and I, I was on a um, MHA did a, um, a virtual town hall about telehealth. And I was one of the people who spoke on it because not only do I have that for my sons, I also have used it as well. Um, and so that's been, you know, really, really helpful. And so as the pandemic continues and we don't know about a vaccination, I'm just a big fan of telehealth. And I think even after the pandemic ends, whenever that happens, we should continue that as an avenue because it, it gives more people access to therapy and care. That's fantastic. We have, one, we have, we have 
one more question. Do you want me to go to that or you want to ask yes. yours? No, okay, this great. says biggest piece of advice for both students and educators at this time that find themselves uniquely different? That's a good question. So that is such an awesome question. Um, so I'm gonna go a little deep on this one just because of my personal situation and experience. You know, I have this book out and you know, there's been conflict and some controversy amongst my friends and family about the book and about me putting the book out and am I, what am I doing as far as my son and as far as myself and even how am I exposing the family? And I'll just tell you that one of my biggest pieces of advice for anyone, students, educators, individuals, whoever it is, children, like when you can, if you can, sharing your journey, sharing your story is so empowering. And it really like for me was like taking an 800 pound gorilla off my shoulders. And it is for me at least therapeutic because I know I'm not the only one. My situation may have been unique, but I know I'm not the only one who went through it. So I guess this may be overused, but it's like live in your truth, whatever that is. I don't want my son to be ashamed that he has experienced a mental health condition. One in five of us do at any given time. And I can raise my hand and say, I'm one of the five at any given time. I have no problem with sharing that. I'm not ashamed of it. I don't want any of my kids to be ashamed of anything they've gone through because at the end of the day, it all makes us who we are uniquely and, and, how, and, it, and it supports how we're able to make a contribution to the world. So, and that may sound like so global, but it's true. You know, I have seen, found myself in circumstances and in dialogue with people I would have never touched and never met had I not shared my story. I don't think everyone has to write a book. I think you can journal. Um, I think you can um, go to a support group. There are a lot of different ways to get your story out and to, to release yourself, you know, to, to give it out. And then in terms of educators, I think it's, um, and individuals like, get used to being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to be as flexible as we can be. We always put safety first, um, but get used to being uncomfortable. And it's really okay if you are the only this, you're the only that, you know, I, for the longest in my line of work, I work in technology um, or that had been my main focus until all this happened. You know, I was the only black I was the only woman. I was the only, I was the youngest one for a long time. Not now, but I was. And I always felt like I had to speak up. What I've learned is I've refined how, when, and why I speak up. There's a difference between, you know, something not working for 24 hours and a life being in, held in the balance. But at the end of the day, like if there's someone who you know is struggling, ask them like, how are you doing? Are you okay? And if they're not okay, you know, there's this training that I've done called QPR. It's question, persuade, oh, hold on, question, persuade, and refer. And it's free through Mental Health America, through, I, I'm not sure if NAMI's doing it, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, and it's something that could really save a life. I had my boys do it. They have QPR for teens. Uh, with so much pressure and so much stress, there's so many things going on in this world. It's really important that we support each other and, and be equipped to do so. It's not like your job to literally, like when you do CPR, you know, you're doing the best that you can. With QPR, it's the same thing. It's like, it's like trying to save a life when it comes to a mental health crisis. So. I would just say really those three things. One, don't be ashamed to share your story, uh, whatever that looks like. Two is get comfortable being uncomfortable. And three is continue to get educated and learn about things like QPR or mental health first aid um, because there are a lot of us in crisis and we don't even know it. 
So uh, hopefully that was a, an answer to the question. <laughs> And that was really close to my next question. So oh, okay. I want to say ditto. Um, it was specifically, when you when you become a foster parent, you take classes and classes and classes to become licensed. And then you continue taking classes. And then you have all of this real life experience. So technically you are an expert. So as an expert on parenting, what is your best parent? Hey, best I'm an advice? expert parenting. <laughs> I'm going to put that on my resume. <laughs> Absolutely. Some people struggle with it, but you are by far an expert. So for people that may be struggling, what advice can you give as a parent? I mean, you will, you will, you've openly admitted that there were times that you struggled as a parent, but you worked yes. your way through it. Yes. So, so what advice? So, yeah. So the advice I would give is, you know, there are a couple of things that I do. I'll start with that and then I'll go from there. Um, I, I belong to a couple of different uh, Facebook groups. I, I belong to a couple of Facebook groups that uh, focus on children with ADHD or autism, that kind of thing. Um, I find the groups that work for me and I go in as I need and I pull back as I need. So I try to take care of me first. Um, I have done a lot of training. I've taken a lot of training around trauma specifically because I think you have to parent the child you have and meet that child where, you know, where, where he or she is. Um, the child doesn't determine how they're parented, but you have to understand, you know, what the child has experienced. And even, you know, a child that you gave birth to. Still, if we think about our kids now having gone through a pandemic, you know, they're seeing what happened to George Floyd, you know, all those things have an impact. And it's, you know, how do we explain those to our children? What I, I am very open about what I don't know. I have a, um, I'll call her like a sister to me. She started off as my son's caregiver and nanny, and she's turned out, uh, we, we call her Miss Q. And she's a poet. She's on uh, Facebook and Instagram as In So Many Words. And when I am at my wit's end, I call Miss Q because Miss Q went through foster care herself. She's an, an amazing, absolutely amazing mother and awesome person. And she helps me think in a way that I don't naturally think. And so I don't seek her approval for parenting. And that's a, a difference with me that I, you know, I was a people pleaser. I'm so over that. I'm not trying to please anybody but I have my go-to people. Uh, I talk to my therapist, you know, I am a person who takes on a lot of guilt about things I have absolutely no control over. And I'll tell you, my son learned how to manipulate me around that because I felt so bad because of all the trauma he experienced. I didn't realize he actually needs even more structure. You know, I would coddle him. I, I am supposed to be raising him with my village to be a man who can stand on his own two feet. If I coddle him, it doesn't mean I don't love him and we don't cuddle and all that, but if I coddle him, I'm not helping him. So for me, like I check myself, um, Carla, don't be an enabler, you know? So you have to know yourself too. And then one of the biggest things is you can't really parent in crisis. You can't give the lesson in the middle of the crisis, whatever that looks like, if there is a crisis. Um, so I give my, just the other day, it was so funny. We learned uh, through his therapy about square breathing. And it's, are you familiar with that? No, I'll, I'll do it really, I'll do it really quickly. It, I mean, it's okay. really quick. It's really quick. Square breathing is like this and you can Google it. It's like you go up on the count of four, over, four, up, down. So it's, it's a square, it's, it's counting by four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It's in and out. I've taught this to my father, who is a senior citizen. Senior, senior citizen. My 10 year old said, mom, I think, you need to, I think we need to do some square breathing. And he was right. Like I was upset about something and it, it was a legit being upset, but he actually was like, hey, let's not forget our coping skills, mom. And I love that. 
so I think it's about, you know, you could get, have all the education in the world and, and I'm a proponent for that. I do webinars and stuff all the time. I try to learn, you know, especially with a child that has, um, has PTSD and, and ADHD. Um, there's so much still for me to learn, but um, I have my go-to people who I'm, I'm open to receiving their feedback. And then if I still have gaps, I will continue to look for the right resource to help me with that gap. And it doesn't mean that I won't, I'll always need to lean on someone like I'm not a black male. That's a gap. I mean, I'm a black female and I do an, an amazing job if I do say so myself with parenting my kids, but I can screw up royally. And there's certain things in my experience that I just don't have. And so I look for that support. And so I, I've been involved a lot with the male's place. They, they were heavily involved with my two older boys. They went, my sons traveled to Ghana and to um, Puerto Rico. They learned how to garden with the male's place by Reggie Signalton, who is an awesome leader. You know, they learned about self-care and a whole lot of different other things, how to be a gentleman, you know, all these things that would have been difficult for me to teach them but again it's a part of the village and like Reggie Singleton will always be a part of my village and I hope he considers me a part of his because I see what he does especially for young black males to help prepare them for life like for when they become men so that so, was a so long answer but hopefully no, I answered that your question that was perfect. Um, Reggie doesn't know who I am, but I'm going to see him tomorrow behind awesome. the scenes because I'm going to go buy some food at the Rosa Parks Market, okay, good. which really yes. tastes better than anything you can buy at anything. Harris. Theater. That's right. That's um, right. And donate my chicken to um, Judith. Do you know Judith Brown? Do you know who Judith Brown is? I'm she not sure. Forward. She what? She runs Project 704 Forward. Oh, I do know Project 704 Forward. I'm not sure if I know her directly, but yes. So she's the creator of that. And I just think her work is um, just as brilliant as yours. Um, and- I need to uh, meet her then. Yeah, definitely. she's fantastic. We'll definitely connect you. Um, so the next thing we have probably about eight minutes left. What okay. I want to know is how all of these viewers can buy your book and how okay. they can follow you on Facebook and follow you. How, how do they reach you? Okay. So the first thing is here's the book and there's uh, this is Journey to the Sun and it is available on Amazon on uh, the paperback or the uh, hardcover. And then it's online everywhere from bookbaby.com to iBooks and Google Play and everywhere else. Um, I also wanna mention one thing before I forget, earlier I mentioned Glenn Proctor. So I don't know if you can see this, but I was a contributor to this book that's coming out in November. And this is all about um, hope, like change, creativity, curiosity, and hope in a crisis called the pandemic. And so I contributed three pieces to this book that's coming out in November. So how people can get in touch with me is on, uh, I have a website, it's Carla A. Carlisle, and it's C-A-R-L-I-S-L-E.com. You can hit me up on Instagram, it's at Carla A. Carlisle. You can hit, and I'm that, I have that same name on uh, Twitter. And then I have an author page on Facebook. It's author Carla A. Carlisle. It's C-A-R-I-S-L-E. And um, I think those are the main things. And if you go to my website, I think I have a phone number posted there as well. You can reach me. Um, you can email me through the, through the website. Uh, you can hit me up on Facebook Messenger um, through the author page as well, because I do check those and, and respond. I try to do as many um, speaking and outreach engagements as I can because, you know, everyone has a different opinion. I really like the way you said it, like, Carla, you're an expert in parenting. Um, someone said to me recently, like, um, well, you're not just a parent, right? You got trained in 
you got licensed or trained or something in trauma. And I'm like, don't diminish lived experience yes. because with lived experience, it is, I mean, I don't at whatsoever minimize someone who's gone to school and become a therapist. I know people who with lived experience who have done that and, and my hat goes off to them. I just tell you, I've been in school for so long. I'm tired of school. I'm just not going to do that, but I do different training and things like that. And, and so um, I really appreciate you uh, making that statement because I don't know if we say enough about people with lived experience. Um, there's a, um, a friend of mine who works for uh, a Peer Promise Resource Network, and, and they're all people with lived experience there. And she really enlightened me to a lot as someone who had gone through the struggle herself as a mom, you know, with uh, drug abuse and based on trauma. And I learned so much. Again, this is like the most humbling experience of a lifetime. But I mean, I don't have enough paper to write the books that I could write about all that I've learned through this and continue to learn. That is so beautiful. Um, do you recommend this for people who are struggling with fertility? Do you recommend um, going through um, the foster care system to adopt? Or how, what, it, what would be your recommendation for people trying to plan a fit family? So what I would say is like really be true to yourself and to be clear. So every, every state has a different... Um, and, and the counties, I think, have different guidelines. I think there are some that have a foster to adoption pipeline, you know, a, a process. Some do not. Some have a, an adoption process and a foster process. And if you're in the foster process, they'll ask you if you're willing to adopt, but not expect to adopt through that process. If you want to adopt, then I would not go that path if you know that your ultimate goal is to adopt. And I only say that because even if it's like a 1% chance, the child may go back and, and, it, and you need to support that decision. And I didn't do it, but I mean, I'm not saying everybody should take my path. Um, if a person wants to foster, like I, I talked to someone recently who just asked me like, Carla, how can I get involved? I want to foster, but I'm not ready. You know, I want to adopt, but I'm not ready. So we talked about things like the Guardian Ad Litem program, Council for Children's Rights. I talked about volunteering through Alexander Youth Network and other organizations like that. I mean, there are a million different ways through NAMI, uh, the local Charlotte chapter or North Carolina chapter. I mean, you know, North Carolina overall or uh, Mental Health America of the Central Carolinas, there are all different ways to get involved and they have teen and young adult um, and even programs for children where you can get involved and influence and advocate for a child um, if you're not ready to take the plunge. I would also say it would be good to consider just going through the training to get a realistic, as realistic as possible view of what being a foster parent entails because it is no joke. And I will say for those people who say, oh, they're in it for the money, then they, they're they really doing the child harm because, excuse me, there's not enough money to take care of the child with what you get. Yes, I can attest to that. I think it was around, we like, I think it's around 76 cents an hour that DSS gives you to raise the child. So. The, you can't, you have to bring your own money to the table if you yes. are adequately taking care of the child. So I wholeheartedly agree with you. Everything yeah. that you said, um, you have definitely spoken up and inspired us tonight. Um, thank, thank you, you, Tiffany Sanders, for allowing us this opportunity. And thank you, Tiffany. Um, <laughs> um, our, our, our time is up. Do you have any last thing that you would like to finish off with? Or we, do we just tell everybody thank you and goodbye? I'll just say really quickly that I had the um, honor of uh, having my blog posted on NAMI.org. 
and I would, I'm going to put that in my chat and I'll put it on my page. Um, and it was about uh, early, it's, it's a series they're doing on early childhood intervention and, you know, getting kids help. And so being able to, again, share my story, uh, share my son and my story to other people, hopefully just gives people uh, encouragement that, you know, we all struggle. And, and there is light at the end of the tunnel. And then, you know, there'll be more, but you'll be more prepared as you go through uh, for the next one, for the next challenge. And Tara, I wanted to say, you know, hats off to you. I love the work that you do in the community. And I'm so glad that, you know, we were able to connect some time ago. Uh, and I look forward to continuing to work with you in the community as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We're, we will say goodbye Thank and um, please find us on Facebook. And um, we really appreciate everybody who joined us this evening. All right. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.